Hello everyone, thank you for attending my presentation. Today, in terms of introduction, I'm going to talk about the challenges of the food industry related to two health and functionality concerns regarding using trans fatty acids and saturated fat. I will then talk about a novel strategy of production of structural lipids that improves the physical properties of fats and oils without using trans fatty acids and with using low amount of saturated fats. After that, I talk about uh, diacylglycerol and rich structural lipids, which address the both concerns. I will explain the pros and cons of production of structural lipids under both atmospheric and supercritical carbon dioxide conditions. I look at the previous work on NMR analysis of, of fats and oils, and then I focus on sustainable production of structural lipids in SCCO2 and optimizing reaction conditions to increase DG level of structural lipids. I finish my presentation with contributions made by this work and possible extension of this study. Cardiovascular disease and cancer are global health concerns and prevention of them has significant public health and economic impact. Health Canada has announced that uh, trans fats should be removed from all food products due to the increase of CVD rate. Also, there is some controversy about the health concern of saturated fat intake. Harvard Public Health School emphasized that there is a strong relation between saturated fatty acids and both CVD and cancer. On the other hand, the reduction of saturated fats and elimination of trans fatty acids are problematic for the food industry, mainly due to adversely affecting physical characteristics of baking fats such as shortenings and margarine. Also, the quality and structure of baked goods would be lower. Here are some potential solutions to improve the physical properties of the baking fats, their health benefits, or both. But each of them also has some problems. For example, palm oil. We have got issues with deforestation and losing animal habitat. Everyone is aware of the plight of the orangutan in Borneo. But... Here, I am trying to produce structural lipids in a sustainable manner. This novel strategy provides structural lipids which don't have trans fatty acids and have low amount of saturated fats, but provide acceptable physical properties in food products such as shortenings. What are structural lipids? Structural lipids can be any types of acylglycerols, including monoacylglycerols, diacylglycerols, and triacylglycerols, that have been chemically or enzymatically modified to include new fatty acids or restructured to have different fatty acids profiles at different positions on the glycerol molecules. A structural lipid have certain physical properties. It allows them to address the challenge. For example, 1,3-BAGs and 1-MAGs have higher melting point compared to TAGs with the same fatty acids. Therefore, partially hydrogenated fats that may have 15 to 35 percent trans isomers of fatty acids can be replaced partially or completely by a structural lipid. Why should DAGs or DAGs be part of a structural lipids? DAGs have some desired physical properties that I have addressed such as emulsifying properties, so they can be a part of the solution of the current challenges of the fat industry. For example, we can use DAGs in the emulsifier system and blend them with unsaturated oils to produce shortenings. Also, DAG enriched oil can be used as a partial replacement for shortenings. Therefore, they reduce the level of trans fats and saturated fats in the end products. Besides, they have additional health outcomes that many studies have shown, such as weight loss and visceral fat reduction. So we can say DAG structural lipids address both health and functionality concerns. Now I am focusing on the production of DAGs. Here a diagram shows oil or fat can produce DAGs after the reactions. While there are many routes to produce DAGs, DAGs for commercial purposes are produced through sterification and glycerolysis. Each process can be performed enzymatically or non-enzymatically. Also, non-enzymatic reactions are faster and cheaper 
they run at higher temperature, mostly above 250 degrees centigrade, which leads to color change and off-flavor products. However, reactions that are driven by enzymes keep the temperature low and the quality of the oil high. The manufacturing process of Dagen Rich Oil is challenging. ADM company used to use the esterification method which has some drawbacks such as oil hydrolysis and acyl migrations of 1,3 dg to 1,2 dg which reduces the healthier isomer. Besides, this method needs post-reaction procedures at a high temperature which leads to the production of glycerol ester. In fact, DAG oil was voluntarily removed from the market due to this possible carcinogenic compound. Now, how can we overcome these drawbacks? Enzymatic glycerolysis is a potential solution for DAG's production due to many advantages. For example, we can use natural oils or fats instead of free fatty acids, so there is no need to hydrolyze oil before the reaction. Another advantage is producing higher DG yield versus esterification. However, enzymatic glycerolysis also suffers some problems. Most of them are related to poor miscibility of reactants, a long reaction time, and high temperature post reaction procedures to increase 1,3 DG level. So, what is the solution? One technique that has proved to be very useful is supercritical carbon dioxide. In SCCO2, distinct liquid and gas phases do not exist. It can effuse through solids like a gas and dissolve materials like a liquid. SCCO2 provides a nice reaction medium that increases the miscibility of reactants cause shorter reaction time and no need for solvent and high temperature post-reaction steps. The most important advantages of the CCO2 is its easy separation from reaction medium by only depressurization. So far, only two works have been done on DAX production under SCCO2. One is a non-enzymatic glycerolysis hydrolysis, and I have already mentioned why this is problematic. The second one used enzyme in ethanolysis reaction. Apart from the fact that we have low yield here, we have got the issue of post-production cleanup. But what I want to do is using SCCO2 and enzyme as potential factors to conduct glycerolysis at lower temperatures. The reaction rate in this system increases, therefore we will expect to have higher DG yield. There are other advantages. No post-reaction cleanup at high temperature is needed. Solvent consumption can be reduced and reaction time can be decreased. Considering these benefits and issues related to previous methods, I advocate conducting enzymatic glycerolysis in supercritical carbon dioxide as a promising technique to produce DAG enriched structural lipids. Once I know what the best methodology for the production of structural lipid is, I focus on the analysis of structural lipids. To overcome deficiencies of analysis of structural lipid by tedious and solvent intensive conventional analytical techniques, I selected quick and reliable nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. In addition, I can qualify and quantify different components of a structural lipid such as fatty acid and acyl PD cells at the same time, but by using NMR. Some studies have analyzed natural oils which have high triacyl PD cell levels using NMR. Also, NMR has been already employed for analysis of some purified lipid mixture. So, NMR is a proven technique, but today has been used only for the purified products. This is a method that actually I use to produce my diacyl glycerol and rich structural lipids. This has been essentially my life for the past couple of years. This is the reaction that I have done for producing this structural lipid. I put glycerol soybean oil and Novozyme 435 in. I could pressurize under SSCO2 or without SSCO2 and then I gave them a reaction time 
and produce my soybean oil based dark oil and then I start cleaning this oil up removing the enzyme by vacuum filtration removing excess glycerol by centrifuge and then I have my oil that's now ready for NMR analysis six different species of enzymatic glycerolysis of soybean oil are shown in this diagram now I focus on the production of 1,3-diacin glycerol due to all the health and functional benefits that I mentioned in the introduction. The first objective is production of structural lipids under both atmospheric and SSU2 conditions to compare the content of products of the reaction, such as both isomers of BHEs, both isomers of MHEs, and free fatty acids. So, for the second objective, what are the independent variables that I want to optimize? Pressure, temperature, reaction time, and enzyme load. For each variable, a defined range was selected based on the literature. Well, the objective is to better understand the effect of each variable on the content of MGs, free fatty acids, and particularly DGs in the final product of SDO after the enzyme catalyzed reaction. In the first objective, we try to produce an SDO using enzymatic glycerolysis under atmospheric conditions. After 8 hours of reaction at 60 degrees centigrade, we get an increase in the percentage of change of DG that shows Topozyme 435 is effective at these reaction conditions. Now, when I charge my system with SSCO2, the last slide was shrunk here and y-axis has been expanded. You can see that pink line now is almost flat. There is a massive increase in the efficacy of this enzyme as a result of SSCO2. Therefore, now that I have shown you the SSCO2 is critical to an efficacious enzymatic production of DG enriched structural lipid, I want to look at how I can vary the reaction conditions to optimize them. In order to optimize the soybean oil-based DAG structural lipids, let's focus on pressure here. Here is my yield on y-axis and pressure on x-axis. I'm going to focus on 1,3-DG, but you actually see the general term of production of other components such as 1,2-DG, MGs, and free fatty acids, and essentially they all follow the same pattern as 1,3-DG with pressure. You can see for 1,3-DG I get a better yield at 450 bar, but because it's only a bit larger than the one at 80 bar, I would advocate operating at 80 bar because then you don't have to use a high pressure pump. In the previous slide, I showed the pattern of one variable pressure. As you can see, this is similar to that slide at a particular temperature. It is high, then drops, then gets high again. What's important here is we add the temperature variable. In general, the model predicts DG yield goes up as my temperature goes up, but it is suffering yield loss when the temperature reaches at 70 degrees centigrade. There are some indications about the optimization at the 60 degrees centigrade that are predicted by the model. Now I develop a model and it has got enzyme load and reaction time, other than uh, temperature and pressure. The model predicts these are my best conditions. And it says you should produce 44.1% DG. And when I did experiment with this condition, 43.7% of DG was obtained, which shows this model is nicely validated. These are the contribution made by this study. SSCO2 is critical for effective use of Novozyme 435 for production of DGs, particularly 1,3-DG. 
low level of all the reaction products detected sensitively and quantified with an excellent accuracy and repeatability using NMR spectroscopy. A model developed and successfully validated to provide a structural edits with enhanced DG levels. Possible future work can develop manufacturing with greener production lines at lower temperatures and higher rates, including oil extraction reaction process, fractionation, and purification. Other future work can be about a structural analysis of fat crystal networks, formulation of food products, for example, baked goods with structural lipids. I would like to acknowledge Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers, MITAX, Canola Council of Canada, NSERC, and the University of Manitoba for providing financial support for conducting this project. Thank you for attending my presentation.